Our call to worship today is taken from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. And this is one of the more familiar one another passages in the New Testament. The message today is going to be taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, dealing with the one another principle. But our call to worship, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. Hear the word of the Lord. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. If everybody would stand and turn to page 19 in your hymnal.
this morning's this uh, scripture reading will be 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. But considering the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes, comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the light nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to establish them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Once again, given to us, Lord, to, to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to lift up your name through your word and through our voices, Lord. Lord, you alone are worthy of our worship. And only by your grace are we here with this opportunity. Only through your grace do we have anything. You are our breath of life. Without you, we are nothing. And Father, so I ask that you would uh, bless our offering to you as we return that which belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's message is entitled, The One Another Principle. And for those of you who paid attention to the e-bulletin that was sent out earlier this week, the sermon passage originally was set for 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 15. 
with the focus being on the last five verses, verses 11 to 15. And as I put together the message uh, this week and did some rather extensive study and came up with an outline and began to put my notes with the outline, I recognized that I would not be able to adequately preach through verses 11 to 15 in one message. And so I've decided to take the one another principle and break it into two parts. And we'll do the second part either later this month or sometime in, in September. So our focus today will be on verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians 5, as well as some other passages uh, in the New Testament. Now, by way of introduction, I want to share with you uh, a passage from Matthew chapter 22. And if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the 22nd chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 22. And to set the context, this is the passage where Jesus has a series of encounters with the religious leaders of Israel with the Pharisees and Herodians, with the Sadducees, and then two separate encounters with the Pharisees. And in these encounters, he is challenged, and he is questioned, and they try to trick him into making a mistake so they can discredit his ministry and his message. And it's one of these encounters that I want us to focus on this morning before we take a look at the one another principle. Because I believe this is the backdrop from an Old Testament point of view of all the one another commands in the New Testament. Beginning in verse 34 of Matthew 22. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. In other words, Jesus is saying, the Old Testament can be summarized in these two great commandments. Love of God and love of neighbor. And it's these two great commandments that form the backdrop of the Christian life and our sanctification. The New Testament calls us to be in right relationship with God on the one hand and in right relationship with each other on the other hand. Now, in order to illustrate this, <clears throat> I've, actually, um, I've actually come up with a, uh, a high-tech visual aid. Now, most of you know that I am somewhat challenged when it comes to technology. And I spent a considerable amount of time putting this together and putting it together in such a way that you will be able to visually see it. <laughs> okay, everybody have this? Okay, this is a, 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 a two-directional arrow, and when I hold it like this, it, it's meant to represent our relationship between God and us. Everybody understand that? Now, here's where it gets a little bit tricky. When I go like this, this represents the relationship that we have one with another. Now, I'm going to be pulling this out uh, two more times, uh, this message, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I went to the trouble of actually putting this together, and I want to use it as much as I can. And two, uh, it's my sincere hope that at some point uh, John Haller can watch this 
uh, recorded message and enjoy uh, the interaction. Okay, so we have this relationship in the Christian life between our right relationship with, with God, and, and we can summarize that as a life of holiness or a life of righteousness, and the pursuit of right relationship with fellow believers, the one another commands. So God and one another. Now, I'd like to illustrate that uh, for you by looking at the Gospel of John, and in particular, the night before Jesus was crucified. Turn first of all, if you would, to John chapter 14 and verse 15. Here Jesus captures for us in a single statement how we can love God. John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. How do we show and demonstrate our love for God? By keeping his word, by keeping his commandments, by doing his will. And how do we do that will? How do we keep those commandments? Through the power and enablement of the Holy Spirit as he takes the word of God and changes us from the inside out. That is how we love God. It is by keeping His commandments. Now, the, the foremost commandment of Jesus Christ in the Scriptures, by far, as it relates to the one another commands, is the command to love one another. We see this in the Gospel of John, as well as in 1 John, 2 John, and 1 Peter and many of the Pauline epistles. The command to love one another. And on this same evening in which he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, he had said earlier, a new commandment I give to you, verses 34 and 35 of John 13, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So, do you see the connection here? If we're going to love God, we need to keep his commandments. The primary commandment of Jesus Christ as it relates to our horizontal relationships is that we love one another. And it's as we love one another that people will know and understand that we love God and belong to him. That's the connection. And it's based upon Jesus' summary of the entire Old Testament, the two great commandments. Think of them as two sides of the same coin. Now, with that uh, introduction in mind, let's turn our attention to the one another commands in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. Encourage one another. We've said in earlier messages, it's the Greek verb parakaleo, from which we get the English word paraclete. It's the word that is used of the Holy Spirit multiple times by Jesus Christ in the upper room discourse. We are to encourage one another. We are to come alongside for each other's benefit. And we see this played out for us in the first epistle to the Thessalonians in multiple passages. And let's just read through them once again and remind ourselves of what we've studied in previous messages. First of all, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, let's look at verses 10 and 11. You were witnesses, 
and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. That's Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. And they were the ones who planted the church according to Acts chapter 17. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Encouragement, one of the, one of the primary purposes of encouragement within the Christian community is to motivate and urge and exhort fellow believers to walk in faithfulness to God's word, to walk according to God's will, to walk in a manner worthy of the God who has called us into his kingdom. And that's exactly what Paul and Silvanus and Timothy were doing. Now that's not simply the responsibility of apostles and apostolic associates. The last time I checked, we have no apostles of Jesus Christ running around this planet. And as such, we have no apostolic associates running around this planet. The task, the opportunity of encouraging brothers and sisters in Christ rests with, with us those of us who know Jesus Christ by faith. Look at chapter 3, beginning in the first verse. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. So they, they had to leave Thessalonica because of persecution, and later on, they sent Timothy back in order to encourage and strengthen the believers there. They'd only spent approximately three weeks in that initial church planting effort. And here we read about Timothy being sent back to strengthen and encourage them. Now look at what happens when Timothy comes back with his report, beginning in verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us, just as we also long to see you, verse 7 of chapter 3, for this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. So their faithfulness, the fact that they were walking in the will of God, that they were implementing the principles of the word of God into their lives, encouraged and comforted Paul and his associates in their affliction as they were being persecuted for the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, it's a two-way two directional arrow. Apostles were encouraged by regular believers just as apostles encouraged regular believers. It's a two-directional arrow. Okay, let's look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Finally, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk or how you ought to live the Christian life and please God just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. Again, talking about the Christian life, talking about sanctification. I'll have more to say about uh, this verse later in the message. Look, if, look if, if you would, down to verses 9 and 10. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write for you, to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, for indeed you practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, parakaleo, we exhort you, we encourage you to excel still more. The ministry of encouragement is a vital aspect of our sanctification. And in order for encouragement to be experienced, there must be more than one person involved. That's how it works. Look at verse 18. After sharing information regarding the 
harpazo or rapture of the church, our gathering together to Jesus Christ in the air. Paul concludes chapter 4 with these words, therefore comfort one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. Exhort one another with these words. Focus on the second coming of Christ. Focus on the reality that all who belong to him will be caught up together with him to meet him in the air and we will be with him forever. Those who have died and gone before us, they will be resurrected and we will be caught up together in the air and we will forever be with him. Then chapter 5, verse 11, which I've already read, as well as chapter 5 and verse 14. And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. It's this verse, when I came to this verse and <laughs> attempted to put all of the notes that came out of this this verse on this week's outline that I realized I had to split up the message. There's just too much packed in these five verses. So we have the command to encourage one another. And when we do that, good things happen within the body of Christ. Now, did you happen to notice the last verse of our call to worship passage today? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. If you'd flip over to that reference quickly. Let me pick it up to set the context beginning in verse, uh, verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. As we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ, the need, the necessity of mutual encouragement within the body of Christ increases exponentially. As the days become darker, as the days become more evil, we will be in need of more and more encouragement one from another. And all the more, Paul says, All the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, this brings me to the second command in verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are doing. When we encourage one another, we will be building one another up we will be strengthening one another in the faith, but they are two, though related, separate concepts. Encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. Now, as, as I thought about what to share with you about building each other up and edifying one another within the body of Christ, this familiar passage came to mind. And I could show you many other passages from the New Testament that deal with this concept, but we're going we're gonna to limit our consideration to this paragraph in the fourth chapter of, of the book of Ephesians. Uh, we're, we're actually um, going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, 
Here's an amazing thing. The Apostle Paul, in, in this passage, lays out for us God's program for the church, how it's supposed to function. God gives shepherds, gives evangelists, gives teachers, gives prophets in the forth-telling sense. This is my perspective and, and my understanding that today we have forth-telling prophets. That's, that's someone who speaks forth the Word of God. He's given these individuals to the church, and it's the responsibility of these individuals whose primary focus is the ministry of the Word and prayer to equip the saints. Their job is to equip the saints. Now, what are they to equip the saints for? It tells us in verse 12. It's for the work of service. And that service can be a host of things within the ministry of the church. It might be a ministry on Sunday mornings teaching the children. It might be a ministry dealing with some practical needs that the church might have. It might be a ministry of visitation to people who are in the hospital. It might be a ministry of home visitation, of people sharing the gospel and presenting the good news of Jesus Christ for those who have not yet believed. There's many different things that we can do as a body. As spiritual leaders of the church, our primary task and focus is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. When the body is functioning on this level, when the body is operating effectively and correctly, where there are many people with gifts of the Holy Spirit as he has distributed, and they're utilizing those gifts for the work of the ministry, and they're doing it in the context of encouraging one another and building one another up. Oh, it's a glorious thing. It's a marvelous thing. And what happens is these spiritual leaders equip the saints. Those equipped saints serve, and that service builds up the body of Christ. Last half of verse 12. And look how far the body of Christ is built until we all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. It's an ever ongoing process until we meet the Lord in the air. We are to strive toward maturity. We are to strive to grow in our faith and to be, become mature believers in Jesus Christ. Paul goes on. As a result, we are no longer to be children. Now, you know, we have, the, we have some children in the congregation this morning, and the Bible has some great things to say about children, does it not? The Bible says that everybody should come to God with childlike faith. Jesus Christ rebuked the disciples when they tried to shoo the children away so that they could go about the, the, the real work of the ministry. Jesus loves children. And he loves men and women. We're to come to Christ with childlike faith. But once we come to Christ, we're to grow and to mature. We start out as babes in Christ, but we're to grow to mature adults. We're to start off as, as, as children, but grow to maturity. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up 
of itself in love. The building up of itself in love. What is the primary command of Jesus Christ regarding the body of Christ? Love one another. I hope you see a pattern here because there definitely is one. Now, that leads me to my third point today, and that is love one another. Now, this command does not, uh, is not contained in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, and I have to go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12 uh, in, in order to develop uh, this principle. So if, if you'll turn back to chapter 3, and let's look at the, um, the conclusion or the summary statement that, that Paul makes here at the end of chapter 3. And again, just by way of review, at the end of each chapter in 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul emphasizes the second coming of Jesus Christ and stresses principles of the Christian life related to that coming. It's as we focus on the, on the return of Jesus Christ, on the second coming of Jesus Christ, that we are sanctified, that we are made like Christ, that we are transformed into blamelessness and holiness at his return. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, I want to kind of tie together what we just read about regarding the, the building up of one another with this principle of love and, and, and use a, a practical illustration to attempt to describe to you how that all uh, works out. I got saved when I was 18 years old. And when I got saved, I was uh, this very brash, uh, proud uh, individual. Um, some people referred to me as being cocky. And I, um, I, I had the kind of personality, on, on the one hand, I had the ability to be winsome. But on the other hand, I also had the ability to be obnoxious. Okay, you got the picture? And when I got saved, there were people who came into my life as a young Christian and they loved me and they poured their life into me and they, they modeled for me the Christian life. And let me share a couple of, uh, of examples for you. The first example that comes to mind is a gentleman named Bill Bowers. And Bill um, was this uh, man about my, my own father's age who <clears throat> was absolutely committed to the ministry of evangelism. He wanted to see people come to Christ. He wanted to share the gospel with all of his heart. And so he would go out and visit people who visited the church. And if they didn't know Christ, he would share the gospel with them. And so here I am, I'm a believer that's, you know, months old in the Lord, and he's taking me out and teaching me how to witness. Now, why did he do this? He did this not because of what I had to offer. He did this because he loved me, and he wanted to show me how to live for Christ and how to grow in my faith. And he wanted to teach me how to share the gospel how to share that news which I embraced and which enabled me to become a believer in Jesus Christ. Having repented of my sins and believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so 
I went out and I learned how to share my faith and I saw people come to Christ. I was, I was months old in the Lord and I saw the power of God being displayed. And it was all because this older brother in the Lord took the time to come alongside this brash, obnoxious freshman in college and teach him about the ministry of the gospel. Now, a second example that I can share from my own personal experience is uh, someone that a few of you know, and, and perhaps more than a few, and, and that's my best friend, Tom Pappas. And Tom, he, he played an incredible part in my coming to Christ. Tom was my best friend, or became my best friend, starting my freshman year in high school. I've shared with a few of you um, the, the account of, of our first meeting. It was in gym class. First day of gym class, Worthington High School, moved into the community, didn't know anybody, and the very first day of gym class, I got into a fight with Tom Pappas. The only fight he ever had his entire life. <laughs> Can I do it or what? <laughs> and somehow, God took that wrestling you know, match, ripping off each other's white t-shirts, which were part of our gym uniforms, and, and brought us together. And Tom developed this longing to see me come to Christ. And it took, it took four and a half years from that first encounter, four and a half years for me to come to Christ. He took me to Bible studies. He took me to his church. We spent time together after school. And when I was a freshman in high school, I bowed the knee. I confessed with my mouth and I believed with my heart, Jesus Christ is Lord. And he died for my sins according to the scripture. And he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What a celebration we had in the living room of his parents' home the night I accepted Christ. Well, we began meeting, we were both going to Ohio State at the time, and we began meeting every day, every single day, Monday through Friday. Let me say it again. We met every single day, Monday through Friday, at lunchtime. And Tom, he would bring his, his lunch, and I would bring mine. We would brown bag it, and we would meet in the stacks in the library and we would eat our lunch and then we would pray for an hour now you'll have to you'll have to ask Tom to share with you what it was like to hear me pray when I was a baby Christian it's it's pretty funny Tom was patient and he taught me how to approach the throne of grace he taught me the value of prayer. He taught me the power of prayer. He loved me enough to do that. And because he loved me, that time spent together praying built me up in my faith. And if, if you would ask him, he would probably say, it built him up too. Because as we relate to one another with these commands, whether it's pray for one another, serve one another, love one another, exhort one another, submit to one another. I mean, whatever the commands are, it's a two-directional arrow. It goes in both directions. And it's designed that everybody participating is built up 
in their faith in Jesus Christ and leads to them becoming more and more and more mature. Now, I found an interesting term. It's the, the Greek word perisuo, perisuo. And I want to look at it uh, in the context of 1 Thessalonians uh, in, the, in the three verses there, there at the top of the slide. But before I do, I, I want to share with you that this word means to be abundant, to abound or overflow, to excel or to exceed. Very interesting term. Look at how it's used in 1 Thessalonians. First of all, in verse 12, but to set the context, let's begin in verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound, perisuo, in love for one another. So it's not just that we love one another, it's that we are overflowing and abounding in love for one another. It's that we're excelling in our love for one another. That you increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. That's talking about sanctification. The process of sanctification. God's will for this body is that it would increase and abound in its love for each other. Now, That's going to take the supernatural enablement of the Spirit of God in our lives because we're sinners, right? We could never do that in the flesh. And on top of that, some of us in the flesh have personalities that tend toward the difficult end of the spectrum, right? Some people are more difficult than others. Some personalities clash w with one another. I know that I relate to some people better than others. It's just the fact. It's how it works. And so we need to be careful about giving each other passes regarding this command. We're to love all the brethren. So that means we, we don't have personal agendas. That means we're not pursuing our desires. That means we're putting their interests ahead of our own. And it's all for the purpose of pursuing the will of God in our lives. Because that's how we're going to be built up. It's as we love and build up and encourage other people. Absolutely amazing principle. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk, referring to the Christian life, and please God, just as you actually walk, that you may excel still more. Excel still more. Perisuo. You're walking in the will of God for your lives, but Paul calls them to excel still more. Why? So that they be, might become more and more mature. So that they might encourage one another more and more. So that they might love one another more and more. So that they might build up one another more and more. Look at verses 9 and 10. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel, perisuo, all the more, or still more. We urge you to excel still more. Now, did you notice? Did you notice the connection 
in the, in the two verses that I just read. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, what's the focus? The focus is on how you ought to walk and please God that you excel still more, right? That's verse 1. And what's the focus in verse 10 in the same context? For indeed, you practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Love of the brethren, pleasing God. Pleasing God, love of the brethren. And they're inextricably connected in the context. And I found and discovered as I prepared for this message, time and time and time again, a focus on right relationship with God connected with right relationship with fellow believers. Principles that, you know, in my Christian life, you know, in the past I've thought about it, you know, as this hand over here and this hand over here. But the scriptures bring the two hands together intentionally, purposefully, so that they might work out God's perfect will. Okay, let's take a look at another term. By the way, um, I, I didn't actually unpack First Peter um, chapter 1, verse 22 from that last slide, but I will get to it before we end today. Let's talk about the word Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Now, that's, that's different than the Greek word Philadelphia. Philadelphia is used twice in the New Testament, uh, once in Revelation chapter 1 and once in Revelation chapter 3. And it's re referring to the city in uh, Asia Minor where there was a church, the church at uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. This is the Greek word Philadelphia. And it means the love of brothers or sisters or brotherly love. It occurs in the New Testament five times and it's the love in which Christians cherish each other as brothers and sisters. And on at least three of the usages, in the same context, either the noun agape or the verb agapao is used, which refers to the unconditional love of the New Testament. But I'd like for you to uh, turn your attention to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. And 1 first, first Peter chapter 1 is related to 1 Thessalonians 4 9. First of all, I'll keep your place in, in 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians 4 9 once again for you. Now as to the love of the brethren, Philadelphia, you have no need for anyone to write uh, to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Agapao. Now look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. A sincere love of the brethren. Philadelphia. Fervently love one another from the heart. Agapao. Agapao. Now, that leads me to consideration of this term. Fervently. Fervently. It's only used in four places in the New Testament. There are, there are three different words 
ectanos, ectanase, and ectanesteron. And they're, they're all related. And I made the most transforming discovery studying this, this term. Not a lot of references in the New Testament, but boy, are they powerful. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Beginning in verse 1. Acts 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John. They were the sons of Zebedee. So James is the apostle James. This is not the half-brother of Jesus Christ. This is the son of Zebedee. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. So here's the account of the first apostle being martyred. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So you've got the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of first fruits. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. And for what purpose? To put him to death as well. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. So this term is used in relationship to prayer. Fervent prayer. Okay, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22 again. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So here it's connected to love. Love of the brethren and fervently love agapao. Now, I do want to mention in passing Don't miss the context of 1 Peter chapter 1. What does he write in verses 13 through uh, 16? Therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ or at the coming or unveiling of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Right relationship to God. Right? I could pull my sign out, going this way. Right relationship to God. And then down in verse 22, right relationship, love of the brethren, fervently love one another. Okay, let's look at 1 Peter Chapter 4. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verses 7 and 8. The end of all things is at hand. This is an eschatological passage. Therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. So whether it's Paul or Peter, it doesn't matter. Fervent love for one another. Fervently love one another. And then the final reference is found in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And I'll pick up the context in verse 39. 
Luke 22, beginning with verse 39. And he came out and proceeded as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. And when he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me. He's talking about the cross. He's talking about being separated from the Father. He's talking about being forsaken by the Father. He's talking about becoming sin for us in order that our sin might be judged in him. That's what he's praying about. If it's, you know, if you're willing, if there's any other way possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became drops of blood falling down upon the ground. And when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow and said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now my point is this. Being in agony, he was praying very fervently. Now, it would be a simple matter for us to focus on the fervent prayer of Christ because of the agony that he was facing. But we would then miss the connection. There's a connection between fervent prayer and fervent love. And that connection is made in this passage. Why was Jesus praying that the cup might pass from him? Because he had taken on human flesh in obedience to the Father that he might come to die for the sins of the world. That he might, might be our Passover lamb. That those who believe in Jesus Christ might exchange their sin for his righteousness. He's praying fervently He's literally sweating blood. So great is his agony. Don't miss. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. A perfect picture of what love is all about. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, at that moment in, in time, space, history, where he's facing the central act of eternity, namely the cross, He's praying fervently. If you're willing, Father, remove this cup, yet not my will, but thine be done. Jesus Christ wants us to love each other fervently. Jesus Christ wants us to pray for one another fervently. Because those two things go together. The one another principle. Right relationship to God. Right relationship with fellow believers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would take this passage, penetrate our hearts. Father, by the enabling ministry of your Holy Spirit, help us to follow you in obedience as we intentionally and voluntarily submit to your commandments. Father, we thank you for the privilege of the one another commands, and we pray that we might embrace them with enthusiasm, understanding that as we do the work of the ministry, which includes the one another commands, That work of service builds up the body of Christ to full maturity. And it's to that end that we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.